والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنتي ليوم الدين Our praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on his last prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day The topic of today's khutbah or sermon concerns what is known in Arabic as Hududullah or the fixed punishment which Allah has set for certain crimes and these punishments have a particular significance to us and to Islamic society, the individuals as well as the community and the society as a whole which cannot be underestimated the enemies of Islam or those who are ignorant of the purpose or the purposes behind the Islamic laws concerning uh, criminal justice have taken this as one of the weak points of Islam that Muslims apply laws which are from medieval times from ancient times when people were barbaric when they treated those who committed crimes very cruelly so they chop off heads and they chop off hands and stone people to death these are all looked at as being barbaric forms of punishment however when we look at the effect of these punishments on the society the peace and the tranquility which comes out of the implementation of these laws we would then have to question seriously the objections that are raised by those either enemies of Islam or those ignorant of Islamic law and its principles I would like to just briefly look at the main set punishment and discuss or present briefly the effect on society of the application of these particular punishments. The first, the punishment for murder. We have the statement by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that those who kill the life those who take a life their lives will be taken the law concerning murder that a person who kills is killed this law has its basis in what is known as the Mosaic law the Ten Commandments the law of the Torah and of course this is not necessarily where it all began but this is the codified form which has been retained in scripture that we know about but the idea the eye for the eye the tooth for the tooth this is a basic law which has been practiced by the Prophet from the recorded time of Prophet Moses and it is enshrined also in the system of Islamic law the taking of a life when a life is taken the importance of this is that if a person does not feel that his life will be taken if he takes a life this becomes an open encouragement for that individual to take a life at any instant if he knows that his life may be taken this will cause him to think it doesn't mean that no one will commit any murders once they know lives will be taken however many of those who may have committed murders if they thought that they could get away with it or their life wouldn't be taken many of those who would have done that would think about it there are some crimes which are what you call crimes of passion where a person just you know flies off the handle you know just goes as Western psychologists you know call it uh, temporarily insane 
and he takes somebody's life. So those type of crimes will continue in any society, no matter what laws you set up. However, for a large portion, it would cause them to think. Of course, uh, Western uh, psychologists, etc., who have studied the issue of, of application of uh, the death penalty, have recommended that the death penalty not be applied in the West because of the fact that it has not significantly reduced uh, murder, the incidence of murder in the society. This is the argument that they, they hold. And in a Western context, this may be so. This may very well be so. Why? Because people are not executed publicly. Because when they want to execute somebody, they take them into a prison behind closed doors, only a few people observe, and that person is executed. It's just reported in the newspaper, statistic, something just, you know, written there. So it doesn't have very much meaning. You know, just like when you hear of so many people starving in this country and so many people dying in that country, these are just numbers written. It's not the same as if you go and you see these people starving. The effect that it has on you is much greater than just reading it as a statistic. Similarly, when the law is applied publicly, when the masses of people, you know, are encouraged to come and see the law in application, this has a much greater effect on the population than when it is done privately. And when you look back in the past, even in America and Europe, in France and in England, etc., people used to be publicly executed. They used to be. You know, if you, any of you have seen the, um, the Wild West uh, movies, you know, when the, that individual is finally caught, the bad guy, you know, you see them erecting this gallows in the middle of the town, in the, you know, on the main street, and they, they hang the person. This is, uh, this is the practice. I mean, and, and uh, it, just, it had continued up until fairly recently. What we find here, for example, where this law is applied, and you have approximately 8 million people here in Saudi Arabia, 8 million people. And in New York City, you also have 8 million people. However, the murder rate here is equivalent approximately to the number of murders in a year which take place here in Saudi Arabia in a year is equivalent approximately to the number of murders which take place in New York City in one week or one to two weeks. This is the difference. We're having a similar numbers of people but with the application of the law directly, the execution, public execution, then you find the incidence of murder is significantly less. The application of this law also can discourage uh, people from committing the crime, people who, you know, may be doing such crimes out of vindictiveness. For example, for example, uh, last weekend, you know, last Friday, four Filipinos lost their heads in Dira here, right? And in case you're not aware of the reason why their heads were chopped off, it was because they were originally five. One amongst them had accepted Islam and he had been going to pray in the mosque and so on. So the other four were so upset about the fact that he accepted Islam that one day when he came back from prayer, they held him down and sodomized him. And after sodomizing him, you know, he was so upset he was trying to get back at them, fight them. Then they stabbed him to death. So the four of them you know, this is just out of their hatred and, and vindictiveness because of the fact that this man accepted Islam. They couldn't let him uh, go. They felt they had to, to degrade him and punish him for accepting Islam. And they ended up killing him. So all four of them who took part in this crime were executed last uh, weekend. So this, the knowledge of this, you know, would help those people you know, who are, are upset about the people becoming Muslims, I have them think twice before they would try to uh, get any kind of revenge or do anything against Muslims. This is essential. Uh, the society, you know, take care of such cases and ensure the safety of those people who are accepting Islam.
Also, we have the law concerning fornication and adultery. We know in the case of fornication where a person has extramarital sex when that person is not in a state of marriage or not having ever been in a state of marriage, the punishment for that act is 100 lashes publicly. If a person has sex outside of marriage, being married or having ever been married, then the punishment is death, stoning to death. This is Islamic law. And this is to show how high Islam values chastity in the society. That people maintain their chastity. And this is for the protection ultimately of females and children. Because the children that are born out of, you know, uh, non-marital circumstances who become stigmatized by the society, people who don't know who their parents are, etc., etc. I mean, this is, this is psychologically devastating for such children. And as I said, the person who suffers the most when such relationships take place tends to be the women. Because the man who is involved in such relationships can carry on and nobody knows that he has done so. But the woman, when she does so, you know, uh, she is no longer a virgin for one or she may become pregnant. And these expose the reality of her situation, you know. So she is the one who suffers herself specifically and the children most. So this, this law is there, very stringent. However, though this law is so severe, and I made a distinction between the person who has never been married and the one who has been married or is in a state of marriage because sometimes people when understanding what adultery and fornication is in Islamic law they think that adultery is only when a person uh, has extramarital sexual relations when they are in a state of marriage however according to Islamic law if they have ever been married it is still considered adultery because the act of marriage for them having been into the act of marriage this provides them with a certain uh, consciousness and a certain protection from adultery or, or fornication or, or relationships outside of marriage which the person who has never been married doesn't have so this is why the law is much more severe for the one who has ever been married and the one who is married than the one who has never been married now Despite the fact that the law is so severe, in all of the cases of executions in a year, you will be hard pressed to find one or two who are being executed for adultery. Of adultery. And those that are last for fornication. There are few. Why? Because there is a condition that four witnesses must observe this act. It means that a person has to be so flagrant, you know, so uh, uncaring in terms of anybody finding out that they've done it in such a public place or in such a public circumstance that four witnesses could observe them. So the law is really, in the case of adultery, it is really on the books as you could say a scare tactic to cause people to think twice. It is not applied just like that across the board. If a woman, of course, the one who tends to be found out is the woman. The woman who does so and gets pregnant, then she is open now to execution because there's evidence. This is practical evidence and she will be executed. But if she points to the man and says, well, he did it, that's not enough evidence to apply the law to that man unless he confesses himself you see so that's why I said the woman is the one who suffers the most you know but the, and the law is there primarily as I said as a deterrent a general deterrent and it is rarely applied even down to Islamic history the number of cases of the application of the law for adultery death by stoning are very few very few Also, the law concerning homosexuality. It is death 
for the one who is involved in the act, both sides. The one who is doing it as, the, as well as the one that it is being done to. Such individuals who are caught in this act, they are also executed according to Islamic law. And this, of course, this sin is, is a major sin from an Islamic point of view. It has nothing to do with whether you're married or you've not been married or whatever. It's just automatic if you're caught in this act. Or if you're caught in the act of bestiality, having relationships with animals, also you will be executed. To any of these forms of deviation, the law in Islam is death. You know, you are carrying with you a sickness that you as an individual have to be weeded out from the society. You will not be given a second chance. You know, in America where people commit such crimes, they're given second chances. You go to jail for a year or, you know, you, you're on probation. And then these people end up committing these crimes again and again and again. So many cases of individuals being jailed and coming back out and committing, you know, very heinous crimes. So in Islam, it is one chance. That's it. You are caught one time. That's it. And one thing to note in the application of the law concerning murder is that there is a concession for a person who is, who is ruled insane. I mean, there is compassion there in Islamic law. If a person is ruled insane, then the law is not applied. However, the ruling for insanity is not as it is applied, for example, in the West, where you have a battery of psychologists, they'll be testing this person back and forth, and, you know, and then they finally end up with a ruling of temporary insanity, and their conditions for what defines a person as being insane, if you were to apply that to the population, you'd have to say that the vast majority of people walking around are insane, in one way or another, they're psychologically imbalanced, etc., etc. No, in the Islamic law legal system, a person is judged insane if they were known to be insane before the act. If they were known to be a person, I mean, they, we know who people are truly insane, we know who they are. Such people, you know, who have no grasp of reality, I mean, they're, they're, their minds are gone before such an act. If they commit an act of murder, then they are not executed. They're put away in an institution or whatever. And I should also add that there is also a, a factor of wherein the family of those, if an individual, if my father, for example, were killed, I have the right to take from the person who committed the murder a uh, fine. It's called a dia. They may pay me a fine instead of that person being executed. However, it is rare that you will find people accepting it. But that option is also there. That a person may take, you know, looking into the circumstance or whatever, you know, that person may judge that the instant, you know, there may have been some sort of justifiable or semi-justifiable factors, you know, a person may accept uh, a blood payment or what they call blood money or, you know, dia uh, for a murder. In the case of the person who takes out weapons, who, who steals, but he, t he does to, to armed robbery, he's a highway robber, or he's a, you know, he robs a bank with using weapons. Such a person then is liable to a punishment of death. He's classified under what is called muharib, one who takes out, out weapons against the society. And he may be executed. The, the legal system has a choice of executing that person or cutting off his right hand and his, and his, and his left leg or uh, crucifying him or banishing him from the land. There's an option. Depending on the seriousness of the crime, the judge may choose one of the different options. Normally for stealing, if a person steals above a certain set amount, then the hand is amputated at the wrist. If the person did so in a fashion which indicates that that person is a professional criminal. What do I mean by that? I mean that if one, you left your watch, an expensive Rolex watch, you know, on a table, 
and you went someplace and somebody picked it up and went with it, they're not going to cut the person's hand off for that. Because there was temptation. It's not that the person, the person may not normally be a professional criminal who's plotting and planning, but due to the instant that he found himself in, there was this temptation and he grabbed the watch. His hand will not be cut off in this circumstance. If also uh, a person, you know, say you're working for a, a company, and I'm not saying this to encourage thievery, but if you're working for a company and your boss is not paying you your salary and you stole from your boss, they would not cut your hand off here either. Right? Because there is some justification here. Your rights were not being given. So they would not apply the law in this circumstance. Or in a time of famine or a time of calamity, you know, where people are in a state of desperation, they may, you know, break into a home here or there to get food or whatever for their own survival, they will not apply the law to such people. The law is then applied to those people like pickpockets. A person, because there is no temptation here. This is a man who has learned a skill you know, working his hand into your pocket, you know, bouncing against you without you realizing it, he's pulled your wallet and he's gone. This is a professional thief who has planned and practiced, you see, he loses his hand. Or the person who, you know, breaks into your home, you know, opens your safe, you know, and takes your, your money out. You know, such a person, one who is that planned kind of a robber, you know, that's the one who loses his hand. Also included in the category of what we said was the muharib, one who has attacked the society as a whole, is the drug dealer. He has been in recent times included because of the harms that comes from drugs. Such individuals who sell drugs, not a person, a drug user, drug user here is not executed, but one who has a quantity of, of drugs which indicate that he is a dealer. He is one who is spreading, selling these drugs. Such a person will lose their life. And I'm sure you know, almost every other weekend or so we see you know, certain individuals coming in from certain countries which are well known for the uh, production of uh, opium, etc., you know, are being executed for this uh, practice. The end result of this is that a person here in this society is capable of living a life of relative safety and peace of mind. A person is not obliged, as he is in other countries, to latch doors, put double latches, put alarms around the windows, and all these different kinds of things that we, we, we find in, in other countries where the crime rate is extremely high. You know, a person can you know, live a relatively comfortable and safe life here. And what it does also is it produces in the society this application you know, a, a, a desire on the part of the people to try to, to stop crime where it may occur. You know, if, we, if they see people starting to fight, you know, in other societies, people may gather around and start to clap, you know, and egg this person on, you know, the big one, the little one, let him beat the big one or whatever. Whereas in this society here, when people start to fight, you'll find people come try to pull them apart. People are concerned to stop the fighting. Right? People will get involved. Whereas in other societies, you'll find people don't want to get involved. Either they're cheering or they just ignore. You know, so you can see major crimes occurring in, 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 in broad daylight and nobody will get involved. For example, not too long ago, I remember seeing a program on, um, uh, what was it, um, either it was Candid Camera or it was uh, That's Incredible. But uh, what they did was they, uh, they had some people break in to a car. You know, in, in downtown New York City, in a ma major cross street, right? The car was parked near the intersection. And here was a man, you know, using crowbar, etc., breaking into this car in broad daylight, middle of the day. People are walking back and forth. They see this man, you know, they give him a glance and they just keep on walking. Nobody. In fact, what they found is, you know, after, they, you know, after this had gone on for, you know, a number of hours, they actually found a couple of people who went and helped the man break in the car. <laughs> you know, this was, this, was, this was the situation there. Whereas here, for example, if somebody observes anybody doing that, likely they will either try to stop the person directly or they will call the police or something. And I remember very, you know, very vividly, one instance when I was, in, when I was downtown, I had gotten out of uh, my car and uh, the car, actually it was, it was my father's car, I had borrowed it, and it had the, it was, a, it was the old model of the um, Mitsubishi, which had the rear view mirrors on the front fenders. 
My father had had an accident and they had fixed the side of the car but they hadn't replaced the rear view. So it was only on one side. You know, and I had always observed that this looks a bit odd. You know, it's either like there should be two or there should be none. So this instant when I got out of the car, I was walking by that side where the rear view mirror was. So I, I decided to check to see how easily could I break this off, you know, could I, could I just remove it. So I started jiggling with it. Whilst I was, you know, shaking it, somebody came and grabbed my arm. So, you know, I turned, I saw the Saudi is holding on to my arm. I said, what do you want? So he asked me, well, what are you doing? I said, well, uh, you know, what business of, is it of yours? It's my car. And he said, well, prove to me that it's your car. So I took him back. You know, my family was still sitting in the car there. Well, because I was going to get something from the souk. So, you know, I, I said, this is my family here. You know, they waved at the man. So he said, okay, fine, sorry. And he left. But here was a man walking by. He just saw what appeared to be some act of vandalism taking place here. And he got involved. What we could call a citizen's arrest. He was prepared to get involved here, you know. And this is the way the society should be. This is what helps to keep down crime. Because once you have this attitude where people just don't want to get involved, then it's very easy for, you know, crime to spread. In the second part of the khutbah, the imam talked about the importance of the application of the law across the board. That these laws are particularly effective when they are applied in the full sense. That is, they should not be applied only to one segment of the society and not to another. It should be right across the board. Anybody who commits these crimes should be liable to punishment of the crimes. There should be no one or no group of people who are exempt. And, of course, we know the very famous uh, hadith or circumstance which happened in the time of the Prophet Muhammad where a woman from the tribe of Makhzum had stolen you know this is a powerful tribe there in, in uh, Medina she had stolen something and the law was that her hand was to be removed so the heads of the tribe they came to Usama ibn Zayd who was at one point uh, he was he's, he's very close to Prophet Muhammad his father had been the adopted son of the Prophet Muhammad in the early period in Mecca, you know, until Allah pro prohibited adoption, right? Uh, he remained very close with the issue, the, the practice of adoption where a person takes on the family name of the person who adopts them. This is prohibited in Islam. You may take a child and raise them like you raise one of your own children, but the child retains its own name, the name of its family, etc. You're not allowed to change that child's name. So, in any case, Usama was approached by these leaders of the tribe to try to talk to the Prophet Muhammad since he was so close to him, try to talk, to talk him out of applying the law to this woman. So when Usama went, he agreed to, he went and he spoke to the Prophet Muhammad the Prophet Muhammad was very upset, very, very upset. And he asked him, I mean, do you, dear, do you have the nerve to come and seek intercession in the application of the laws of Allah. He said, you know, he's very upset. And he called the people and he told them that this is one of the reasons for the destruction of the people of earlier times who came before. Because what they used to do was when a powerful person, a rich person stole they did not apply the law to them. But when a poor, poor person stole, they applied the full weight of the law. See, this is what's the cause of their destruction. So from this, we understand that, Islamically speaking, you know, it is very important in the Muslim society that the law is applied across the board. Because if it is not, then it leads to corruption in the society. It leads to destruction of the people. And furthermore, it, 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 it uh, breaks down the confidence of the people to break down the confidence in, in the law and, and lead them to disobey Allah, to go against the law. And there's also, you know, verses from the Quran that the Imam quoted wherein, you know, Allah mentions that those who disbelieve from the children of Israel were cursed by 
Prophet David because of the fact that they would not prohibit crimes which they themselves did. You know, very important that uh, people also apply the law to others and apply it to themselves. Now that they should be committing crimes and then punishing others for committing those same crimes. So, in summary, the khutbah spoke to us about the importance of the application of the Sharia. And it spoke in particular in concerning the area of criminal justice. That the application of the law, it protects the society as a whole, protects the safety and the security of the individuals that make up the society. It also protects the resources of the society. Because when you consider the number of people who are in jail for these types of major crimes who will spend the rest of their life in jail, what you're finding is that the society has been punished for this man's crime. He's a murderer. You put him in jail for the rest of his life. You have to, you're paying for his lodging, his food, you know. What did you do? So the society is forced to pay for these thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who are sitting in jails who committed crimes against the society, the society now must pay for them. You know? They're living in, in jails, they, you know, they have television and they have, you know, uh, some of them have, you know, rights to visit uh, their families, their families will come, women will come visit them, all these kind of things. I mean, they're living, as we say in America, high off the hog, you know, they're, they're living a very comfortable life in that sense. It's not to say that, that the jails are in all cases comfortable. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, viciousness, etc. that goes in there, right? But a person who, when he goes in, he learns the, 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 the um, ins and outs. I mean, he can live a, a life in which he's being taken care of for the rest of his, his days. He doesn't have to think about going out to work, etc., etc. You know, even have people actually will commit crimes, so they will be put in jail, so they won't have to, you know, struggle out there in the society. So, the Islamic system, you know, it, it protects the society from having to pay for the crimes of the criminal. A person commits such a crime swiftly, you know, in a very short space of time that person is executed. You don't have a legal system where that person now, if he's able to, to buy very expensive lawyers, you know, and they're able to find the loopholes in the law that he can get off, you know, because in America, the top lawyers who make the top money are those who are able to get off the, the biggest criminals. Right? I mean, this is, this is like the criterion of being the top lawyer. Uh, whereas in, in the Islamic legal system, there's no such uh, arrangement. What you have instead is a criminal is brought before a judge or a tribunal of judges. The evidence against him is, is brought. If the evidence is, is, is uh, what you say, foolproof, it's 100%, then the law is applied to that individual. I mean, he'll lose his life if the evidence is 100%. If there is any doubt, as to whether he actually committed the crime or not, they will not apply the law. They will only apply it when it is like 100%. In many of the cases here, in fact probably in most of the cases, there is confession. Confession uh, is made by those who actually commit the crime. But there are, there, are, there are other cases where the evidence is so complete that there leaves no room for doubt. So what happens is that you don't have a lot of money being wasted in, in the court cases and the defenses and the, the retrials and all these different kinds of things which the, the public ends up having to shoulder the burden of. And the people who have the least money pay the most in terms of taxes and you know, maintaining the society. So by the application of Islamic law in its swift and sure fashion, it protects the society, the wealth of the society, ensuring that it can be now utilized in more constructive and progressive means. Because when you think of the millions and millions of dollars spent, billions of dollars spent in maintaining these criminals and the court costs and all these things involved, if you took that money out, you could, you know, all those, you have over a million people right now in America, the richest country, you know, most powerful country on the earth today, you know, at least materially speaking, uh, where you have one over a million people who are living in the streets. These people could be given homes and fed. America where free education is not free. 
where, you know, you, your education is free up to grade 12, but after grade 12 it's not free. You have to pay. So it becomes the right of the rich. Health care is not free. This money which is spent on maintaining prisons could be used to make education free, to make health care free in the society, you know, and really fulfill the so-called, you know, democratic goals. You know, because America, which is, you know, the, the biggest uh, screamer for democracy, I mean, when you really look into the society, you find that democracy is just a word which is quoted. It's convenient. But when you look in practice, I mean, what does democracy mean? I mean, where it means that the majority of the people, the wishes of the majority of the people, uh, you know, are put into effect. If you ask, you know, the majority of people in America, you know, would you like to have free education to a PhD? They will all agree. But it's not there. If you ask them, would you like to have free health care? They would all agree. But it's not there. And it's not because America is not economically capable. So this is clear evidence that democracy is a joke. It is a joke. So the application of the law, the application of the law which does not allow compromise, it's not according to the convenience, should not be according to the convenience of the ruler or the, or the, the, mo the powerful elements in society. And it is divine law, not something decided upon by men, you know, from time to time where you can vary it and change it, you know, like the, like the uh, capital punishment in, in America where it was banned at one point and now they're bringing it back in, you know. Maybe ten years from now they'll stop it again so it's, you know, it's in a state of flux. You know, it is not something which is set. Good and bad in that society is, is relative. You know, what may be good today will be bad tomorrow. What was bad today will be good tomorrow, you know, this type of a situation. No, the Islamic society, through divine law, establishes a solid foundation for morality, which doesn't change with time. And those laws are applied across the board, except under extreme circumstances. As I mentioned, cases of, of uh, hunger and, you know, uh, starvation, etc., etc., but under normal circumstances, the law is applied across the board. And with it, it provides for the society a state of peace and security which no man, no man does not wish for. This is something very real. And it is something that I observe myself personally in talking with many of the Americans who came here for Desert Storm and who found Islam here. You know, and went back as Muslims to America. Many of them who I talked to, you know, mentioned that one of the most or most pronounced uh, differences that they found in the society was this state of security, where they could walk downtown, you know, after 12 o'clock at night and not feel that they have to be looking over, you know, their shoulder, you know, left and right as, as they walk you know, in the back alleys or, you know, in the main streets. And they could, if they bought a gold chain, you know, they could wear their gold chain, you know, or the gold ring, you know. And they don't have to feel afraid, you know, they have to, uh, to hide it or whatever, you know, as they would, you know, back home. This was, this had a very pronounced effect on many of them, which caused them to question, why? Why is it that this exists in this society? You know? So, these laws which Allah has set, they are set based on Allah's knowledge of human nature. Allah who has complete knowledge of human nature knows what is good for man and what is not. He has set these laws for the benefit of the individual, the family and of the society. And it is the duty of Muslims to establish these laws wherever they are able to establish themselves, wherever they become the majority, the ruling majority or whatever, it is their duty to apply these and as well as the other laws which constitute the Sharia, the divine revealed law from Allah. So that is the summary of today's khutbah. Uh, if there are any comments anybody would like to make or any questions, they may now do so.
uh, in terms of the sisters, for them, who, those who wanted to ask questions, we said they could write them on some paper. Hopefully, some people brought paper. And uh, they could be brought upstairs to the door here, and one of the boys will collect it and bring it across to be read. So, first, we will look at uh, questions which relate to the application. Sit in the back row. Which relate to the application of the hudud or the divine uh, laws concerning criminal justice. The punishment against it is on an apostate. And uh, it has been uh, prevailing. Some Muslims have been the curse of God, and the line of God, and the prophet of God. That's what I had to say yesterday. So somebody was to Do you know the detail of the execution? Can you repeat the question? Uh, okay, the, um, the, the Imam did mention, I forgot to mention, the Imam mentioned also. Uh, concerning one of the, the laws in Islam, concerning the law for ridda or apostasy, that yesterday an individual was executed in, in, in the eastern province for apostasy. Uh, uh, he denied uh, that the Quran was revealed uh, by God. This individual, the, 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 it was quoted that this is what he uh, yes, stated. That that's the that is uh, made up by the Quran and the birth of God because of the prophet. Okay, so this individual was publicly executed because he cursed God and cursed the Prophet وسلم, and denied that the Quran was revelation from God but that it was and claimed that it was made up by Prophet Muhammad. وسلم. That individual was publicly executed. And this is one of the laws which uh, for a Western uh, Westerner they, they look at it as being, you know, particularly offensive. That the, where is the freedom of speech, they say. You know, you're not free to speak your mind and express your beliefs. If you do so in a Muslim country, you will lose your life for it. The point here to be made, to be explained to such people, if they really want to understand, they have to be, they have to be told that Islam is not a religion like Christianity. <coughs> what I mean is, it is not a religion which has been divorced from the legal system of the society. You know, it's a Christianity accepted a principle of giving unto Caesars, that is to the temporal power, what Caesar wishes or is due to Caesar, and giving unto God what is due to God. They made a separation between what they call church and state. Whereas in the Islamic system, there is no such separation. The religion is all-encompassing. The state is Islam. It is not separate from the religion. And in the West, if you commit an act which is against the security of the state, you are judged to be a traitor and can also be executed. Okay? So they have this law also. Only they will kill people for material concerns. Because you have threatened the well-being of our material state, we will kill you. But if you threaten the well-being of our spiritual state, doesn't matter. It's all right. So to them, it's not important whether you believe in God or you don't believe in God or you worship Satan or whatever. And you do, you do your own thing. But our material society, this is everything. So we'll kill you if you threaten that. Well, in the Islamic system, there is no separation. When you curse God, you are threatening the whole society, spiritually and materially. So in that case, you become a traitor and you are executed. So this is what, this is the rationale behind it. Because Islam is, it's like a nation. It is not just a religion in the Western concept, but it is the way of life of the nation. And whatever threatens that nation, that way of life, 
if it reaches a certain level as being classified as uh, apostasy which is to be equivalent of a traitor such a person will lose his life to protect the rest of the society protecting the society how? in the sense that if a person is of weak faith if such a person is allowed, the other one is allowed to, to openly express his disbelief, then those of weak faith are liable to fall in with this person. So when this person is executed, those of weak faith, they will keep their mouth shut. Those who are hypocrites will be quiet. This sounds as though we are forcing people, you know, to practice the faith. No. If you don't want to practice the faith, then leave. You know, if you go to another country, it's not that uh, we will be sending, you know, death squads hunting you down to, to kill you because you decide you don't want to, to be, you know, one of the members of the society anymore. No. But in the midst of the society, you would be eliminated for the protection of the society as a whole. And we have, Salah is compulsory. People are obliged to make prayer. See, there's no compulsion in the religion in the sense that nobody is compelled to enter. This is the point. There's no, no one is compelled to enter the religion. However, once you enter, it's serious. You're taking on a commitment. A full-scale commitment. So, once, you know, this is why it's very important for us when we are explaining Islam to people that we shouldn't take it lightly that you know just encourage well just say your shahada come on in you know don't worry about it you learn as you go along no no let them know what the basic principles are let them understand it clearly and be accepting Islam out of full conviction not out of convenience you know or emotionally it should be intellectually out of full conviction knowledge so such a person becomes a true follower, you know. However, once a person has entered, then he is obliged to stay, unless he flees to another country, you know, and decides he wants to give up the practice. Or if he internally, for example, within the country, he decides he doesn't believe anymore, what he does, he keeps it to himself. You know, he may have to go through the motions, but his disbelief which is in his heart, nobody is going to go to check what is in his heart. You know, we don't set up inquisition courts where people are now brought up and your faith is tested, you know, finding out the details of your belief, trying to track down those individuals. No, that's between you and God. But at least on the outside, in the society, the basic principles have to be applied and abided by. incident happened to him a couple of years ago where he left the kingdom uh, went back to the states and left you know if a, an individual uh, looking after his home so we give them the key to his home huh oh he was his driver so he, I mean you had, he had access to your home in other words right he lived in the home and uh, the brother had left a jewelry box or a box of jewelry um, without unlocked and some of the jewelry when he came back was lifted, you know, was stolen. And uh, when he confronted the individual with it, uh, the individual admitted and uh, got the jewelry back and returned it. 
to him. So he was asking whether this would be considered a case of temptation, whether he should have locked up that jewelry, and we would say yes, this would be a case of temptation. You know, if the jewelry box had been locked and then he broke open the lock, then such a person would be liable now to uh, losing his hand over the issue. But in this case, you know, we are. It is our duty that, you know, we do not tempt people because everybody has their times of weakness. You know, you go through problems, personal crises in your home and back home or whatever, you know, and then you find yourself doing something which you wouldn't normally do. So we should not, you know, uh, put temptation in, in, in front of people uh, where we have goods of this nature. We should lock them away, you know. Well, that is, that's virtually the same as being unlocked. I mean, because when we say locked... If it were locked, then he knew where the key was. ...alone to have the key, right? You know, not locked if you gave him the key or, you know, something to that effect. Inshallah. Okay, our brother raised the question, uh, and it should be raised really from both sides. If a man or woman saw their husband or wife in an act of intercourse with somebody else, I mean, what can they do? I mean, if such a person is a known righteous person, either woman or man, can they go to the court and, and would their witness be accepted? No. The witness in and of itself will not be accepted. However, they have the option, they're told to swear by Allah that this in fact took place and to make three oaths like this. The fourth time they invoke Allah's curse on themselves if they are liars. Then the male, the, the, their husband or wife, fifth time, sorry, four times, they, 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 so this is like equivalent to the four witnesses. What they're doing, they swear four times, sorry, it's not three times, four times that this person has committed this act, and then the fifth time they invoke the curse of Allah on themselves uh, if they are in fact lying. Then, the, their partner is brought before the court or the legal representative and given the choice of admitting or of making a similar oath. And if that person admits, then the person is executed. If the person doesn't admit and makes the oath and, and calls on Allah's curse for themselves, then the court, they, are, they become separated, they become divorced. Their marriage is cancelled. That's as far as the court can go. Because without other witnesses, you know, as has been said by Allah, then even the most righteous of people, because we are judging righteous people by their external actions. We don't know what is going on inside of people's hearts. So even the person we thought to be the most righteous, uh, they could be lying. You see, so the court is not going to ask without that full set of witnesses. Well, I mean, this is the, 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 uh, the, in the case where the individual who witnessed the act killed those who are involved in the act. You know, um, uh, this now is something which the court would look into, the circumstances. If the evidence, you know, does support that this actually took place in and such an act, right, then, you know, it is possible that some leniency may be given towards that person who committed, who ex killed them, you know, out of a uh, state of, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, of jealousy, you know, extreme jealousy, whatever, you know, that, that some leniency, you know, if the evidence does support that in fact this was the case, not that they went and killed two people and set up a circumstance, right, you know, uh, 
that some uh, concession would be given. You know, because of course, one of the people involved may be actually not married or not having been married. In which case, the punishment for such a person would have only been lashes and not death. So we can see it most easily for the case of your husband, you know, the woman killing her husband or the man killing his wife. But then the other person involved, you know, that person may not have been due to be executed. However, as I said, the, uh, the, ca- the, the case would be, you know, judged in accordance with uh, the rulings given by the, the judge. The judge would have to look into the circumstances and, and make a ruling. I mean, it is possible that uh, if there is enough evidence supporting the claim of that person that they actually caught them in the act, etc., that that person may lose their life. But if there is sufficient evidence, etc., then the court may be lenient to the person and let them off. You know, as did happen in the time of Omar, where one man had done this, killing his wife and the person involved in the, the act, and that man was let off. That I am not certain. I'm not certain whether the four witness, I would imagine that is the case, but uh, I'm not certain. If there's anybody here with a background in Sharia could confirm, uh, if not, then we'll try to find out for next week to confirm you know, what, uh, what is the case in terms of witnesses for uh, homosexuality, whether it is also the four witnesses or whether less than four would also be accepted. In reference to the uh, khutbah, uh, in an Islamic society, should they be more concerned about fear of punishment from Allah in the afterlife? And, you know, because uh, one of the uh, examples you gave for capital punishment in a Western society was the hanging that took place in London and beheadings to a certain point. And this in no way deterred crime. Crime was still rampant in that society because they didn't have other things in place to prevent uh, crimes of prostitution and theft and things of that nature, even in the high government circles of the society. Uh, and the reason I ask is because uh, I've read that uh, the laws governing capital punishment in an Islamic society um, were actually prescribed to frighten, or, or not, not, to, not, not prescribed to frighten people into obeying Allah, but they were actually prescribed to, uh, to keep people who were deviant in the society and who uh, had a propensity for preying on people who were, who were peaceful and who were trusting, all right, but getting them out of the society and thereby preserving the Islamic uh, content of the society, keeping it intact. But, but the basic question is, are, we, are these laws prescribed so that we're frightened by the laws or we should be more concerned about the laws? Well, Islam recognizes that people are in different levels of faith. Those who fear Allah and would not commit the crime because of the fear of Allah, you don't need the law for them. You know, we don't need that law. Because their fear of Allah would stop them from committing such crimes. Whereas, the larger proportion who fear Allah, but the fear is on such a level, such a low level, that it is not sufficient to deter them from committing such a crime, then they fear the application of the law. The law is there to put fear in their hearts from the application of that law on themselves. It's really, the law is there for the weaker members, weaker in faith, generally speaking, all of the laws. Because if a person is of strong faith and you tell that person, drinking alcohol, will destroy your spiritual link between yourself and God and, 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 and harm your relationships with people, etc. This was enough. This would be enough. And you find initially when the revelation of the laws concerning the drinking of alcohol, it came, it came in a gradual fashion. In the early recommendations, it was enough for some people, they just stopped. But for other people it needed to be more certain and more definite and the law had to be 
are put there, 80 lashes. So, what we have to be certain of is that the law, this strong, powerful law, is really for the weaker members of the society, weaker in faith, who need to see the big sick, you know, who need to see and to realize that if they do such a thing, they will suffer the consequences. Whereas for those people whose faith is strong, it, if the law wasn't there, it would be fine. However, what Islam also takes into account is that even those people of strong faith go through periods of time when their faith gets weak. They don't maintain a constant. So if they are in a period of weakness and Satan comes and makes an idea appealing to them, you may find them committing a crime which they would not normally do. So the powerful law is also there for those times of weakness of those even of strong faith. That when they, their faith in terms of consciousness of God dips, their consciousness of the power of the law and the consequences is enough to keep them in line, keep them in check. So uh, I would beg to differ with what our brother was saying concerning the application of public, uh, public uh, executions, that in the time when there were public executions, it did have an effect on the crimes that were being punished for. However, I would support him in the fact that the, with people not fearing a consequence from God, then it would not have as great an effect as in the Islamic circumstance where uh, the law is there not only for the uh, fear, putting, put fear in the heart of people who do not have a good consciousness of God, but also to confirm in the minds of those who fear God that Allah's laws are being applied, uh, that they may be, they may put their full trust in Allah and in its application and that this trust would also help them in their faith in deterring them from crime. Non-Muslims governed by Sharia in an Islamic society? Yes, non question, are non-Muslims governed by Sharia, this is these laws in a non-Muslim society? Yes. The non-Muslim who kills somebody or steals, etc., he will also be governed by these laws. Okay, I'm going to read a question from the sisters. Uh, question, if someone, for instance, has been married and was separated at the time the person has not embraced Islam and later became a Muslim, if a ch chance came when the person decided to settle down and both are Muslim, will that person be punished under the Sharia law? Will the marriage under is under the Islamic law be valid? What will happen to the previous marriage? Is there any punishment for it? Okay, um, I, I, what I think the person is saying is that if a person were to live in a circumstance, uh, uh, what we call in the Philippines, they call a live-in circumstance, where you know a man has a woman and he's living with her like his wife, but there's no marriage ceremony has taken place, you know? Or in America we call it shacking up, you know? Uh, you know, if a person lives in these kind of circumstances, right, then um, they become Muslims. According to Islamic law, they should get married again. Because this was not marriage that they were living in. There would be no punishment for them for what came before, because we know Islam cancelled whatever came before. In one of the statements of Prophet Muhammad that Islam cancelled the sin. Whatever wrong you did in the past, this has been cancelled by your acceptance of Islam. If you follow through, because if you come into Islam and then you become corrupt, then you will carry the sin of the previous time. You are no longer absolved of it. That's it. So, so that ab absolution is on condition that you continue in a righteous path. And also it's on condition that the crime that you did did not involve 
the taking of somebody else's property. You know, if you stole somebody's uh, property, then you accept Islam. Though Islam wipes out the act of stealing, it doesn't make halal the thing you have stolen. So, if you have accepted Islam, you must now take that thing you have stolen and return it to the people that you stole it from. Right? You are absorbed of the sin of the stealing, but you are not absorbed in the sense that you can now keep that. It makes halal for you what you stole, no. So, such a person uh, who lived in such circumstances, they would not be considered sinful after Islam and the law would not be applicable to them. Uh, they would remarry. Um, if they accepted Islam, and continued in such a relationship, you know, a woman accepted Islam or the man accepted Islam, and they continued in a live-in, shack-up uh, kind of situation, of course they now become sinful. Once they continue that relationship, they become sinful. It's just like a man, for example, or a woman, uh, sorry, a woman, who accepts Islam. If she accepts Islam and her husband, a person who she's been legally married to, does not accept Islam, then she may not have sexual relations with this man. If she does, then she is committing a sin. It doesn't take her out of Islam, but she is in sin. She is committing a sin. So, uh, when she accepts Islam, though she may go back to her husband to try to convince him to come to Islam, etc., she has to hold him off. She should not have sexual relations with him until uh, she has finished trying to bring him to Islam if he, if he decides he doesn't want to have anything to do with Islam then she now must make the choice if her faith is strong she has now to make the choice of separating herself completely from her husband divorcing yes. if and because according to Islamic law the, the marriage is cancelled it's nullified when she became a Muslim her marriage was nullified it became null and void at that point in time so it's not really even divorce, but she may have to go through divorce in the legal system which requires divorce for that separation to take place. I hope that answers the question. I could also just mention uh, that if a person was married in the Christian system before Islam, when they come into Islam, you know, the, the person and the, the husband and wife, they don't have to remarry. I know some people mistakenly think that it becomes necessary to have an Islamic marriage. But no, if you are married legally, in a system before Islam, then you may continue that marriage after Islam without having to remarry. Uh, another question by the uh, sisters, why is it that only expats are executed? Uh, who are executed are well publicized. Are there uh, Execution done, or oh, executions done to local countrymen? Yeah. Most of the executions that are taking place, they are not to expats. Most of them are to local people, and they're publicized. They're explained usually on television, you know, the crime is read out, and etc., or maybe in the newspaper, and publicly when it actually takes place, before they do the execution, the crime of the individual is read. It's read out publicly, so everybody knows what is the crime being applied for. Uh, what you find is that those who are executed locally, mostly it is for murder. Whereas those that are executed for bringing in drugs into the country, naturally it's expats who are normally who are bringing in drugs. You know? So you find uh, most of those who are executed for drugs are expats. But you do have some local people who have been involved in drug rings, who have been caught and publicly executed also. Yes, uh, just to uh, confirm that for the sisters who asked this question, that the person who was an apostate, who was executed for apostasy yesterday in the eastern province, this person was a local uh, citizen of the country, he was not an expat. Let's, let's be doing what uh, There was a question raised. Uh, before we go, let's stick with the... Um, with the questions concerning the hudud first. If we run out of those, then we come back to general questions, okay? Concerning hudud? Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Regarding India, will you please explain further, demanding even the help from the penalty imposed 
Okay, our brother is just asking for a little more clarification on the payment of what is known as dia for somebody who commits a murder. Now, if a murder takes place and your neighbor, you know, kills your father or your brother, the male members of the family have an option of taking uh, a, a blood, uh, blood money, which may be whatever the person offers. If the family members accept it, then that person is no longer executed for the crime. Okay? What may happen is that when that person, if it was a father, he was killed, for example, and he has a child who is one year old or two years old, boy, they will wait until that child, this is one of the few instances where you find a murderer waiting in jail for 10 years or 15 years. They will wait until that child reaches the age of puberty. That is around 15. And the question will be put to the child, to the young person, young man at that time, would you accept, you know, this money in the place? If he says no, then the person is executed. And this is the only time really when you find that uh, process taking a period of time. Now that's in a case of what we call manslaughter in America, is that right? Accidental death. Yeah, this is, no, yeah, yeah, this is a case of, no, when you're saying manslaughter, what do you mean? Accidental death? No, no, no. no. Yeah, I mean, when you, when two people get into a fight, yeah. there's different levels of manslaughter. Let's say two men get into a fight and one hits the other one, hits, he hits his head up against the wall and he dies. No. Uh, where it is judged or ruled as accidental death, this is not the case. Uh, accidental death, a person pays a set uh, fine for the life of that person. Where the, pers where, the, where the case is judged as murder, where the person has struck that person with an instrument which could... Huh? You mean premeditated murder? A person can plan another person's murder and they proceed to kill Whether it's premeditated or a person hits the other person with an object. I mean, if I hit you over the head with an axe, you see, I cannot say I didn't mean to kill you. Right? You know, this is an instrument which normally causes death. You see, so in such cases that it's ruled as murder. You know, even though you just happen to grab it because that was what was nearby, but this is an instrument which normally causes death. But if you just punch the person, and the person fell and hit his head on something and died, then this is not considered a case where you have murdered that person. Right? They make, they make a distinction in, in this case. Okay? What would be the Islamic punishment for a certain specific case? Like, for example, that if one individual who deceives other individuals, what he used to do is to approach this low faced individual, promising them that he is willing to help him to have a better job. But in turn, one he normally first do is to ask an advance amount of this individual and he has victimized too many individuals already. What will be the punishment for him in this case? Uh, our question is concerning an individual who victimizes other people through what we call in the West a scam. You know, he's got some kind of a letter or, you know, some kind of a program that he offers. You give some money in advance. He, he promises you something in return, either a job here or whatever. So he, he, he tricks a number of people into giving them his money and their money is and then he runs off with his money. What happens to such an individual? This, is not, this does not constitute the type for which the hand is removed. Now, this is up to the discretion of the judge, you know, how, uh, how this person may be punished. They may be punished by whatever properties they have being sold and the money is gotten back and given back to those people and he may also spend a time in jail. You know, this is a, a case of misrepresentation or, you know, deceit, you know, like forgery. You know, you, we see people, you know, being caught for forgery, etc. So what the usual the punishment, they're given some lashes, uh, spend a year in jail, uh, they're given also a fine, you know, of the money which has been taken illegally, this is returned if it is possible. Uh, these are the, uh, it's up to any the judge as to exactly what will be the punishment for the person. But it wouldn't include the cutting of the hand. You want to add something to that? Blood money. This is set by the court, but the, uh, the, the person who takes the blood money can go beyond that. And it's just less than that. Indeed, he might sometimes uh, forget the killer. Uh, it can just less than that if he chooses to.
Yeah, okay, I mean, this is what I had understood from the beginning, that it is not, it is not really set in the sense that it has to be this amount. Uh, in the case of accidental, I mean, there is again a set amount made, but the person, the, the uh, family does have the right to, to forgive the person altogether, you know. And it's even mentioned in the ayah, in the Quran, you know, concerning the, the, the murder issue, that, you know, that uh, forgiveness is also an option. Yes, we mentioned it. There is. Okay, what you mentioned initially was in the case of um, accidental murder, you know, where a person dies from accidental crime, that there is a certain amount of money paid. In the case where a father kills his own child, uh, according to Islamic law, you know, as um, practiced by a number of the, the schools of Islamic law, such a person is not executed. A father is not executed for killing his son. He may be punished, uh, jailed, you know, a variety of other things, but he is not executed for uh, killing his son because of the principle that he was the one who brought him into this life in the first place. You know, a uh, certain, certain concession is, is made on, based on that fact. Brother, uh, just one more thing that I would like to say about, uh, you know, the immigration by, by so many countries that education is just uh, being done without so much due process. I think we need to emphasize that uh, before that education takes place, a thorough investigation is being done by the highest court, and in many, many cases, several years before an education is taking place. Well, no, it's not usually several years. But what happens? Yes, because I know people from Philippines. You see, the Philippines are saying that if you kill this way, next week you'll be executed. As if there is a situation that there is no due process. No, there is a due process, but it doesn't take years. So in some cases I said, we need to decide that a thorough investigation is being done. Three or two or three families were killed about two weeks ago, two weeks ago. Yes. The three years. Three years. Depends on the case. Depends on the case. Yeah, it depends on the case. But normally speaking, you know, the, the, the process of justice is fairly swift. It is fairly swift. Once the evidence has been gathered, etc., the ruling is made. But what the point is that it is not just the ruling of that judge which, uh, you know, uh, automatically this person is executed. The, the ruling that the person has made is reviewed by a higher uh, counsel, you know, which will look into it and look over the evidence again and ascertain, make sure that there are no possibilities. And then this has to be also ratified by the king himself. A decree is made where it is again looked over. So there's like three levels before the actual thing takes place. And this is what would give the, the time process. But the issue of when a person is commits a, a murder, or it's, so, so the evidence is brought fairly rapidly, the person is brought initially to the first uh, court. But then, you know, the case is reviewed, you know, twice after that, before the actual execution takes place. So this is what gives it a certain amount of time. But relatively speaking, in comparison to what happens in, 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 in uh, other societies, it's relatively swift. Sorry. Sorry about that. Islamic country, the Islamic country where Muslims live in, you go to the same procedure, but you don't get killed. Is there any difference in the eyes of Allah and the hereafter? Ah, the question, if a person commits a crime in a Muslim society uh, for which he is executed, and com or commits a similar crime in a non-Muslim society for which he is not executed. I mean, how is he judged in the sight of Allah? Well, you know, of course, Allah ultimately judges people according to their intentions. If they have turned back to God sincerely in repentance, a person commits a crime in a, in a non-Muslim society, turns back to God in sincere repentance, that person may be absolved of that crime, you know, in Allah's sight. 
though the, the law has not been applied to them. Whereas somebody else in a Muslim society may commit that crime and the law is applied to them. But they have not repented within themselves and are still held to account on the Day of Judgment. You know, so ultimately it goes back to the person's own intent, whether they do turn back to Allah ultimately in repentance and whether, the, uh, uh, whether they will still have to be account how Allah judges them. And we have the classical case, you know, in the time of the Prophet where one woman, you know, had committed adultery and had turned herself in to be executed. The Prophet had sort of tried to discourage her from actually turning herself in, but she insisted, you know, he told her to come back after she delivered the baby. She came back, you know, giving her time and also the option not to come back. Uh, but she came back, you know, she still wanted the law to be applied to her. He told her to come back after you finish weaning the baby, another two years, you know. And after the two years was up, she came back. So when there was nothing left now but to apply the law, because here she is confessing and wants the application of the, of the law, she was taken and stoned to death. And during the course of the stoning, you know, some of the blood splattered on the, the garment which Omar was wearing. Omar was there taking part with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And when the blood splattered on his, his garment, he cursed it. So the Prophet Sallallahu forbade him from cursing the blood of this woman or the woman, saying that the repentance that this woman made is so great that if it were divided up amongst the inhabitants of Medina, it would have been enough to absolve them of their sins. This, uh, this repentance, this is Prophet ﷺ informing something which was revealed to him by Allah, because he doesn't have the authority to say this, this is from Allah, saying that her repentance is so great. And if divided up amongst the inhabitants of Medina, of Medina, it would have been sufficient to absolve them of their sins. You know. So, that's what we said. Ultimately, it goes back to what one's intentions are. Okay, inshallah, uh, the pizza in is waiting for us. Uh, we, we, are, we have gone over our, our time point. It's now after 2 o'clock. So, you know, we'd like, so because there's a number of people here who have to get back you know, they've come from far distances, transportation has brought them here. We have to try to stay within, you know, a certain limit. And, and, yeah, so the point is that, you know, other questions can be made, you know, given to me personally, whatever, as we're leaving, you know, if they can be answered or they can be raised next week. But so as to give, you know, brothers a chance who, you know, have come from long distances and, and are anxious to, to have lunch, you know, uh, uh, that we should uh, stop at this point here now. Um, we ask, we ask Allah to accept, you know, the, the, our intentions for being here, you know, one in terms of seeking knowledge, uh, understanding Islam, to improve our practice of Islam, to take what the Imam has given us of the khutbah, you know, concerning the importance of the application of Islamic law, that we should strive in whatever area we go back to or whatever we live in, to try to apply these laws to the degree that we can, and uh, we ask Allah that he accepts uh, all of our our deeds, uh, righteous deeds, is being done sincerely for His benefit, and that He give us the reward of paradise in the next life. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Nashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.